Then we will move on to the next talk, which will be presented by Birgit Savitsky. Now, Birgit holds a W3 professorship for translational immunology in our BIH section, um, termed exploratory diagnostic sciences. And indeed, we at the BIH, we think that we need strong translational research also into the diagnostic areas to contribute to a better understanding, of course, of disease mechanisms and to identify novel targets for intervention, actionable targets. Um, Birgit actually started to work at the Berlin Institute of Health very recently in October. Um, and her CV um, shows that she's originally a biochemist uh, from the Humboldt University in Berlin. And she completed her doctorate already in our environment at the Charities Institute of Immunology. Um, subsequently, a Wellcome Trust Fellowship took her to the United Kingdom uh, for two years as a postdoc at the famous University of Oxford. And you may know that Berlin has many strong ties with Oxford and Cambridge and also London. And this is just one example of what came out of such an interaction. She returned to Charité in 2003, uh, first to lead the Transplantation Tolerance Lab at the Institute of Medical Immunology with Hans Dieter Falk. And then she received a few years later a W2 Associate Professorships in Applied Immunology at Charité in this institute, where she focused initially on transplantation and immune tolerance. Now, uh, around a year ago, she was offered a a great position outside of Berlin, and we were afraid of losing her. And um, uh, she's really instrumental with her expertise to dig deeper into all the sorts of questions where we have disturbed immune mechanisms in disease. So we decided to offer her a full professorship at the Berlin Institute of Health, which she accepted. And indeed, we are proud to have her now uh, on board. In brief, so Birgit investigates how immune cells interact in severe inflammatory responses, and she's no longer bound only to the field of transplantation, as we will see in her presentation. Her overall aim fitting to the purpose also, uh, the aim of our institute is to identify uh, actionable targets um, by investigating the immune system in great detail. So Birgit, it's your turn to present. Thank you very much for um, the really nice introduction. Um, and I, I, I hope I can uh, deliver uh, the promises you made. So um, as the title already indicates, um, my lab or my group focuses um, mainly on elucidating the mechanisms driving protective versus pathologic uh, T cell responses. But um, very often T cells, of course, are, they, they do per se do not act on their own. So they interact with other cells of the immune system, but also cells, uh, non-immune cells. So that's why um, in most of our investigations, we are not um, only looking at the T cells, but also on um, to other cell types. Um, the, the, the real aim is by elucidating the mechanisms to, to find uh, new targets for uh, therapies, as Christopher um, already mentioned, uh, uh, which we then would also um, like to uh, translate into clinical trials and uh, monitor the patients treated with these new um, um, therapeutic options. So that's basically it. And, um, and I will give a brief introduction into the field and into the world of T cells. T cells, as you all um, may know, are instrumental in really uh, orchestrating um, the immune responses to foreign pathogens, but also to um, tumors. And, and it's, it's very important that this is tightly controlled so that after a certain time of uh, proliferation, amplification of the T cell response, you induce a resolution of the response to avoid uh, immunopathology. And thereby, uh, very famous um, other uh, T cells play an important role, and uh, those are the regulatory T cells, but also other immune suppressive um, mechanisms are acting, so really uh, to avoid overshooting. 
And this is in particular important uh, by, uh, for controlling also um, uh, immune responses uh, elicited against self, as indicated here, but also harmless antigens like as allergens or um, foreign transplants. And um, this can, of course, go wrong, either if the T-Rex uh, are lacking completely or um, do not, uh, are reduced in numbers or do not function, or if the inflammatory mechanisms driving this um, expansion of um, activated T-cells are out of balance. And then we get um, autoimmune diseases um, that at least can lead to the rejection of foreign transplants and very famous in the last uh, nearly two years or one and a half years um, can also lead to infection associated immune pathology. So you see this um, response driven by T cells needs to be really tightly controlled. And this is what puzzles me um, in my research. Uh, yeah, and we actually um, uh, do uh, try to answer these questions or elucidate the mechanisms um, by looking at uh, uh, disease or treatment response specific immune phenotypes, um, special, special functions which are only operational under uh, pathological conditions, and also to understand the driving signals leading to um, those phenotypes and functional alterations. And then, as I said, try to test um, uh, the targets we identified in new therapeutic concepts. And we do that mainly um, focusing on organ transplantation and infection and also cancer, but uh, also from time to time in other disease um, um, situations. Um, the, how we do that is uh, shown in, on the cartoon on the right side, but I just um, already mentioned that uh, a minute ago. I will um, explain how we do that with two examples. And the, the first example will be um, transfer of regulatory um, T cells into kidney transplant patients. And the uh, second example, uh, mechanisms we um, revealed driving immunopathology in severe COVID-19. Um, uh, but I will start with the first example, of course, because it's the first example, and that is T-Rex transfer and kidney transplantation, which was um, tested mainly for safety, but also partially efficacy in an EU-funded project, which was called the ONE study. Why is that so important? The problem is that at, at the moment with the um, new uh, conventional immunosuppressive drugs, which were developed about 20, 25 years ago, the, the first, uh, the short-term outcome is, is really good, but then um, we lose the, the organs and the, also the transplanted patients in the long-term. So we did not really achieve improved long-term um, graft survival or patient survival. And this is due to the fact that um, with the, the, the patients then or the immunosuppressive drugs uh, lead to toxicity, uh, you, they, the patients develop infections or tumors due to the fact that they need to uh, take these conventional immunosuppressive drugs for long term. And so there's a huge need uh, for new therapeutic options which allow reduction of these conventional immunosuppressive drugs um, to reduce the burden. And uh, one approach to, to uh, achieve that or, is by transferring the regulatory T cells I mentioned at the beginning. And there are different um, types you can actually transfer. And though this was tested, I, as I said, in, in the one study, in a really multi-center approach, uh, involving different clinical sites around the world, not only um, Europe, but also San Francisco and Boston. And my um, lab was uh, involved in uh, organizing and performing, analyzing a standardized immune monitoring and looking at um, changes in immune cells, subsets, function, and so on. And we could um, actually publish the, the first set of results in, a, uh, in Lancet last year. What uh, we did is we first started off um, in elucidating what is different in patients with end-stage renal disease, here shown in red, to 
age matched and age and gender matched healthy controls. And the principal component analysis already shows you that there's quite a few um, differences in the immune cell composition and function um, between the patients and healthy controls. And one example is, for instance, the um, marginal zone like B cells, which are reduced in numbers and also relative um, terms in these end-stage renal disease patients. And they are important because they are uh, supposed to be one source of a, uh, an anti-inflammatory cytokine IL-10 and, and thereby play an important role in damping uh, inflammatory responses. What um, when we did these multicenter clinical trials and compared the outcome of um, reference group patients to uh, patients receiving the different, and here really the result of all the different uh, regulatory cell products are summarized together, um, was that the patients um, developed far less infections. And as, as I just mentioned, this is a major aim to really reduce immunosuppressive drugs or alter the, uh, the treatment so that the patients do, not, uh, do no longer have an, an elevated risk of developing infections. And that's what we could actually achieve. And that was a surprise. We didn't expect that um, because that already was apparent at the time when the patients um, did receive very similar immunosuppressive um, drugs. What um, became apparent is that uh, the regulatory cell therapy did not only result in better clinical outcome, so minimization of immunosuppressive drugs at the long term, but also reduced infections, but it also led to a normalization of the immune cell composition. So at the end of the, of the observation period, the patients, for instance, showed uh, nearly normal levels of uh, just one example, marginal zone like B cells, as said, a very important source of IL-10. And um, also the regulatory cell therapy in a dose-dependent manner uh, led to an increase in the TREG numbers at the end of the observation period. So this was the first example. Now come to the um, second example, and that is immunopathology in severe COVID-19, and what role T cells play um, in with this aspect. When you um, study T cell responses, um, you can either do it or maybe both together at the same time by um, re-stimulating T cells from patients with peptides from the path pathogen, in this case, um, SARS-CoV-2, and look into the um, frequency and also phenotype of the T cells able to respond to um, the peptide stimulation. And the mar a marker um, which helped to identify these responsive T cells are um, uh, shown here, CD137 and CD40 ligand in case of this CD4 positive T cells. This is um, um, one um, way of looking at it. You can also do an explorative ex vivo phenotyping. And I think this goes along um, both um, approaches because you can have activation of T cells in a bystander manner, which is, might not be driven um, solely by um, the TCR and peptide recognition. And there you look basically at a portfolio of activation markers and how this is altered maybe in severe COVID-19 compared to other um, disease groups. And this is exactly what we did. We um, looked into samples from mild and severe COVID-19 patients and compared the response of the T cells um, to other disease groups, other infections, acute infections or chronic infections. We did that applying single cell proteomics, um, mass cytometry in combination with single cell RNA-seq and then um, uh, studied the functional consequences mechanisms of the identified um, SARS-CoV-2 induced T cell populations and also identified driving signals of these populations. And I um, start with a heat map coming from the mass cytometry results where we um, show uh, a cluster analysis or the outcome of a cluster analysis uh, digging into the, the three main T cell compartments and that is CD4 helper T cells, CD8 cyto positive cytotoxic T cells and gamma delta T cells. And um, the heat map indicates when the marker is expressed at high level with a red color. And um, as you know, 
the, if the color is blue, then it, uh, there's a lack of expression of the certain marker. And when you look into um, uh, the clusters we identified, um, I my took uh, or, um, four clusters caught my attention. And that is, um, they look very similar for the CD4 and CD8 compartment. One cluster always, which looks normal, I, as I always say that, uh, for activated T cells, and then next to uh, this cluster, a cluster which looks a little bit atypical. And why is um, um, that the case? So the, the left cluster, cluster 7 and 25, they show um, expression or the T cells in these clusters of classical activation markers like HLA-DR, CD38, but also the proliferation marker T67. But the clusters next to it, what they have in addition is high expression of CD16 and also chemokine receptors such as um, CCR6. And this is not so typical for T cells. And when you look at the abundances of these clusters that you see these atypical clusters 8 and 26, they are really increased in the severe COVID-19 patients in comparison to all other disease groups. Whereas the classical activated cluster goes also up um, in the mild um, COVID-19 patients. So this is summarized here on, on the bottom that we have this atypical uh, phenotype only in severe COVID-19. Why is that so interesting? Um, CD16 is an FC gamma receptor, um, which means that this receptor binds the constant region of um, certain IgG subclass antibodies. And this is used by NK cells in order as an activating signal um, for in, in, the, in a process called antibody dependent um, cellular cytotoxicity. So upon binding of antibodies to target antigens, um, the FC receptor of NK cells can recognize that, and this um, is an activating signal, which then leads to the release or induces the release of um, uh, cytotoxic molecules and um, thereby uh, killing of the infected um, cells. This is okay for, for in cases, whereas in T cells, usually use a peptide um, recognition via their T cell receptor to become activated and then elicit um, cellular um, cytotoxicity. And this is, I, I think, for a good reason that they only use this mechanism, because um, uh, adopting a phenotype like this will really uh, get them out of control of a normal TCR-dependent me um, activation mechanism. Um, we could uh, validate um, the, uh, our findings of the existence of CD16 expressing um, T cells in severe COVID-19 with single cell RNA-seq. FC gamma receptor 3A is the gene name for CD16 or CD16A. And uh, not only in blood, but also in bronchial alveolar VASH samples, where we see a cluster high expression of this um, gene. And this is especially enhanced in severe COVID-19 patients compared to other disease indications. And this cluster, and this brings me to the function, already shows um, that the T cells probably have a very high cytotoxic potential with all these genes being upregulated. And gene set enrichment analysis really uh, um, also proved that these T cells have an increased cytotoxic potential in um, severe COVID-19 compared to mild um, T, uh, COVID-19 T cells. And um, is that cytotoxic potential really also um, uh, transferred into real cytotoxic potential and upon triggering of um, antibodies um, binding to CD16 was then tested. Uh, we developed an assay where we coated beads with spike protein and um, incubated that with serum from patients, um, uh, from severe COVID-19 patients. And indeed, this could elicit degranulation as a, a proof of cytotoxic activity of the severe COVID-19 um, T cells. And this is much higher uh, in this disease group uh, compared to mild patients. Okay, but what kind of functional consequence has that uh, with regard to the disease um, development, the pathology we will see, this, um, the damage um, uh, of the lungs? 
And uh, to find that out, what um, together with the group of Wolfgang Kübler from the physiology department, what we did is co-cultures of lung endothelial cells with T cells from severe COVID-19 patients, um, and then triggered them again uh, via CD16 and studied how this um, alters the endothelial cell function. And what was particularly interesting and um, really a surprise that is that this um, led to the release of chemokines attracting neutrophils and macrophages by the um, uh, and co-cultured endothelial cells, as you can see down here with this um, graphs. So this has uh, real functional consequences, as you can see. And this is not only, we don't only have these T cells. They're running yeah. out of time, so. Yeah. Present yeah. in the blood. We also have it in the uh, lungs, as you can see here. So it's not a blood epiphenomenon. Um, then I will just sum up. We, we also identified uh, signals leading to the induction of um, these cytotoxic uh, CD16 expressing T cells. And this, in this case, is the complement split product C3A, which really leads to the um, differentiation of these T cells. And we can inhibit that by uh, adding a neutralizing um, CD C3A antibody. Um, this population it has uh, is really important because um, we see a huge, uh, significant difference in the frequency of this population between severe patients surviving the disease or dying of um, the disease. So um, at the stage where they are clinically completely identical, so it has also predictive um, power. Okay, um, I. I already mentioned that we have in, in a normal course CD16 negative T cells, which are quite uh, nice and will lead to the re resolution of the infection. And in severe conditions, we get these altered phenotypes, which act TCR independent and cause lung damage. With this, I'd like to thank all the people involved. Um, uh, all the ones on the right side have been involved in the COVID-19 um, studies, but I also like to thank Ed Geisler in particular for driving um, the uh, TREG therapy or the regulatory cell therapy in transplantation in the one study. Thanks and sorry for being over time. Perfectly fine, beautiful data, beautiful work, thank you. <clears throat> so far there's no question in the chat, even though we are over time, I have one brief question. It's obviously, uh, um, interesting to ask whether similar mechanisms are involved in PIMS, the uh, pediatric inflammatory multisystem syndrome that can occur after COVID-19. Um, yes, of course. Uh, I, I mean, I'm involved or I'm actually um, leading a BMBF funded um, a project, recast, where we look into um, the disease cause of children. But so far, we had only one um, child developing a severe um, disease cause there. Uh, of course, the, 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 uh, 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 it's good that it doesn't occur so often. And um, indeed, we observed higher frequencies of these activated CD16 positive T cells in that child. But with this uh, very low N number or N equals one, it's difficult to make a claim out of it. But I think it is nothing specific for um, also COVID-19 or severe COVID-19. Uh, we did not see it in influenza, though. Uh, but I can imagine that it plays a, a major role in an in inflammatory immune complex driven um, diseases, autoimmune diseases. And this is what I'm um, looking at in, um, in to now in more detail in some upcoming projects. Okay, thank you very much, Birgit.